Hello, um, I'm here today to take you on a virtual tour of the museum. My, my name's Fiona. The actual building um, is called the Documentation Centre. Uh, the traditional name, of course, uh, that was chosen by the Nazis, was the Congress Hall, the Congress Halle. And uh, most remiss of me, I haven't mentioned the name of the exhibition yet. And um, when we designed the exhibition, we decided not to put it up into words, but to um, portray it in pictorial form. So you have these two very large pictures um, at the entrance to the exhibition. Um, and you can see here, the large blown up shot uh, shows you what was really a preparation for the real thing to come, a display of military prowess, um, and later, of course, to result in the, the Second World War. And here in the inset, um, you have um, some spectators at one of these rallies and in a typical salute, of course, uh, the Hitler salute. Um, and that reveals for us um, the title uh, of the exhibition, which is namely Fascination, as we can see here, Fascination with the Führer and the cult and these goings on, and uh, the terror, of course, which was very soon uh, to erupt. So fascination and terror, and that's the name of the museum, uh, or rather the name of the, the exhibition. Here in the first room then, um, we go into the background, the 1920s, which was a period um, of great upheaval, of course, um, and especially here in Germany, having lost the First World War, um, and resulted, of course, among other, in a massive hyperinflation. And one of our exhibits here is very interesting. Um, when we look down there, we can see the banknotes, and we can see the amount of zeros um, on those banknotes. That situation, um, of course, led to um, varying factions being for power against the, the young, the very young Weimar Republic. Um, right and left wing. Uh, one of them, of course, was uh, the party whose spokesman uh, was Hitler. If we head over here to the graph, it gives us a very clear view um, of how the um, political uh, landscape developed in those years. Um, I'm not dreadfully keen on graphs, but this one really shows us um, the very variated landscape. You've got lots of different parties here, as we said, being for power. Um, what you initially can't see um, in the 1920s, and for a long time, of course, is the very bottom party here, which is, of course, Hitler's um, uh, Nazi party. Um, it basically doesn't figure at all. That doesn't change um, until, of course, roughly here, where, as we said, you have the Wall Street crash. And then, of course, um, the Nazi party picks up ground massively. And as we can see, um, garners 44% um, by 1933, um, establishing, firmly establishing Hitler in power. Um, interestingly, uh, when we look at the posters above us here too, we can see an important aspect of that regime, and that was their handling um, of publicity, if you like, um, their propaganda measures. You, above us here, we've got various posters, um, again, from different parties. So even here we see that uh, uh, the Nazi um, um, engagement with their propaganda was uh, more effective, more sophisticated uh, than perhaps their rivals. But we're going to have a look at this propaganda element in the next room as well. Here in the second room, um, many of you might be familiar with this site, um, the Brandenburg Tor uh, or Brandenburg Gate uh, in Berlin. And we obviously have a procession here uh, with many, many people celebrating something. Of course, it was the victory parade um, of Hitler and his party having won the elections. Except, of course, it's not. Um, this was one that the Nazis shot, uh, if you like, for the history books. Um, when it happened in January 1933, there wasn't actually those um, appreciative crowds there. Um, so that wouldn't do. And uh, in August of the next year, they reshot the occasion, as we said, for the history books. Some of you may recognize the picture here. Um, it's what today we call the Bundestag, uh, the Reichstag. And it was a, there was a fire here. Although we don't know 
who actually set the fire. A culprit was apprehended and also paid uh, with the deed for his life, whether he committed it or not. Um, but as we said, for the Nazi party and for Hitler, it came um, at the right moment because it enabled uh, the Nazis to say, look uh, to everybody, uh, we're under threat here. We need to be protected. We need extraordinary measures. Um, we have to introduce emergency laws here. And that, of course, was very dangerous, as you can imagine. Um, it resulted in what we call in German the Ermächtigungsgesetz, uh, the Enabling Acts, which basically or virtually turned Germany into a police state. Uh, we're going to have a look at how society was organised under the Nazis in the next room. Um, it's probably the smallest room in the exhibition and I sometimes think that that was intentional because it gives us an idea of how um, society was so strictly, um, soon very strictly, to be controlled. And if you look at the, the, the the posters, you can see there's lots and lots of different signes. Uh, these represented all the different associations to which basically you really had to belong, probably also wanted to belong. But of course, for the Nazis, it was the perfect opportunity to keep people under surveillance um, and, of course, to indoctrinate people as well. Um, if you take a closer look at what these associations were, you can see the, the lawyers, the, uh, the, the, the women's union, or You've got the Beamtenbund, that was the, the civil servants. So as you can see, you've got wide swathes of society where you're really under control through um, these different associations. Uh, we've also got an interesting concept here too. Um, we've got um, Gemeinschaft statt Gesellschaft, as we say in German, but it means a community instead of society. So what we've really got here is this fixation on the Führer, the leader, and his people, the Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community, uh, which was taking the place of uh, democratic institutions. From here, uh, we're going to uh, proceed to another room, and that concentrates really on the cult of the leader. We were talking about the leadership cult, the Führer cult, and that explains very nicely um, how that was achieved. It's perhaps interesting to note that um, the Nazis probably intended to dis, um, disband all religious ceremonies as we know them, like Christmas, Easter, etc. Eventually, uh, the year's calendar would have been taken over by purely Nazi events, uh, the 1st of May, for example, the Harvest Thanksgiving, and of course here, um, probably the most important of all, the, the Nazi party rallies in September. No. And as you can see, the emphasis was on these massed events. Again, we're back to the community and the Führer, and the picture shows you how that worked. The masses, of course, were just a mass. That was why they were important. But if you look at the masses there, they're all blurred. Uh, there was no room for individualism. Uh, you were only important in the sense that you were part of that mass, all eyes, as is perfectly expressed by the picture, are centred on, of course, uh, the Führer. So the cult of the leader, uh, very much to the fore. What we haven't talked about, though, um, here in Nuremberg, was why did Hitler actually decide to have the rallies here? So one of the reasons for choosing Nuremberg was certainly the historic significance and the emotional impact uh, that you know that would um, arouse, evoke in people's minds. Um, obviously, there were um, very practical reasons for holding it in Nuremberg as well, and one of them, of course, was centrality. If you look at a map of Europe today, uh, you'll find that uh, Franconia and Nuremberg is pretty bang centre. The Nazi party rallies attracted around a million people to them every year for one whole year, week in September. Just imagine trying to get that amount of people to a place if you don't have an efficient infrastructure. Nuremberg had it. So again, a very good reason for holding uh, the rallies here and the proximity to Munich. Uh, the heart of the movement where the Nazi party was founded in 1919. We're going to continue now and take a closer look in detail at what you know, actually went on at these rallies. Um, and here we have um, Albert Speer, who was um, 
generally responsible uh, for all buildings um, on the Nazi Party rally grounds, the Reichsbaumeister, um, as he was called. He was later, or he was going to be entrusted, um, even with remodeling uh, Berlin, which was going to become the world metropolis Germania. But what we do see here is the monumental architecture, of course, that was designed to glorify the regime. Obviously, the Nazis are not the first people to think of doing that. If you look through history, uh, many uh, civilizations have um, used buildings uh, to, as a vehicle for their propaganda. Hitler, of course, very clearly uh, said it. Um, architecture is ideology set in stone. And Albert Speer, of course, was the man to translate that into stone form. Albert Speer actively uh, funded and supported the SS, who in 1938 um, started forming co commercial companies, earthwork and quarrying companies. And you can probably guess, if you look at the picture, what they did. They set up work camps, concentration camps, next to these quarries. And the inmates, of course, worked in appalling conditions and were basically worked to death. So we're going to have a look at, uh, as we said, what actually went on at these rallies. Each day, as we said, they lasted a week. Um, well, originally they lasted um, around five days. The first one was five days, but they became so popular that by 1938, when the last rally was held, they'd been extended to eight days. Uh, such was their popularity. So from women, we can have a look at the children, and I'm sure many of you are familiar with the Hitler Youth Organization. And again, here we see a picture of these young uh, youngsters here proudly marching, bearing arms, or not bearing arms, but bearing their flags, but in many cases soon to bear arms as well. Um, the Hitler Youth was divided up into two groups, um, the 10s to 14s, the 14s to 18s, and of course the 14s to 18s would be already getting um, sort of more or less military training um, and would take their oath and join the army, uh, as we can imagine. But this gives us an idea of the pride that was experienced by these young men coming or having the honour to come down and parade at Nuremberg. Or here, as you can see, as we said, each day is devoted to a different organisation. So here it's the day of the SS and the SA. Uh, they were the participants in that event, um, around 250,000 of them in all. Uh, so a massed event as we are um, familiar with at the rallies. Um, over here, um, I, there's an aspect that we haven't had a look at yet, um, beyond, of course, um, drumming up support um, and celebrating the, the cult of the Führer. Um, an aspect that is often ignored is the fact that it was a very money-making event as well, because these events weren't free. Huh? You had to pay admission fees, and if we look over here, you can see the... Um, the admission tickets. Um, back then, um, they cost between three and five rice marks uh, from around 30 uh, to 50 euros, uh, the equivalent today. And if you think about uh, some of the events attracting crowds of up to 140,000, well, yeah, that's quite a lot of money. So it was a very money making event. So we'll head all way now from the, um, the Nazi party rallies themselves to take a little look um, or a closer look at ordinary life um, and its aspects um, under the Nazis. On this poster, again, we have the name Nuremberg, uh, the Nuremberg Laws. They were promulgated uh, during the 1935 rally. Um, as we said, all the rallies had mottos. The 1935 rally motto was the Rally of Freedom. And as we said, they often had cynical connotations. Um, and that indeed, uh, in a sense, was cynical because the Nuremberg uh, Laws severely restricted the freedoms of the Jewish people at that time. Um, and again, of course, you have um, uh, the, the contents of the Nuremberg Laws, which among other things uh, stipulated, of course, that there should be no um, intermarriage uh, with Aryans and uh, Jewish people, um, people who defied um, these rules, um, as we can see on this panel here, uh, were of course publicly humiliated as this young girl uh, has been um, herded through the streets there and having to uh, bear this poster in front of her because she apparently had a romantic attachment 
to a Jewish person uh, through your publicly disgraced, so to speak. Um, the Nuremberg laws then, the Nuremberg race laws, and um, life becomes increasingly uh, difficult uh, for Jewish people. So here we can see that um, the indoctrination um, took place at a very early age. Um, um, if we look at some of the examples in the, in the showcase, uh, we've got perhaps first graders here uh, simply practicing their letters. Um, I think when I was at school, we wrote the cat sat on the mat, but um, uh, German school children of the day had um, quite different sentences um, to practice their letters. And then we have the accompanying uh, pictures, uh, stereotypes of uh, the Jew portrayed really as the archetypal bogeyman. So you can imagine the effect that that would have on young untutored minds. And if we take a look at uh, some of the other um, posters or panels here, uh, we can see, of course, that um, other restrictions uh, were imposed um, on society. Uh, we've also, uh, we've already talked about persecution uh, of Jewish people, that's what most readily springs to mind. But of course, Sinti and Roma uh, were also persecuted, and it wasn't just persecution. Um, um, it also extended to German people themselves. Um, the term euthanasia uh, springs out here uh, because, of course, the Nazi dictum was if you weren't of sound mind and body, uh, of course, you were not fit to be a member of that Volksgemeinschaft, the people's community. And the euthanasia program uh, carried out by the Nazis claimed around 335,000 lives. So leaving um, behind the aspects of uh, life in Nuremberg, um, again, we see here on our left the run-up uh, to the Second World War, 1939. Uh, no more rallies are held here, and uh, the devastation of the war uh, takes hold. 1939-1940, the Blitzkrieg, as it was called, uh, the invasion of Europe, which initially um, goes according to plan uh, for the Nazis. They become confident, 1940-1941, the armistice, and then things take a different turn. We see the pictures here, the devastating pictures, uh, which of course ultimately resulted in the last panel here, um, Holocaust, um, a term with which we are all familiar, um, the utter uh, terror of the death camps. And of course, it also takes us um, through to this um, last part of the exhibition as well. The picture that meets, us eye, that meets our eye here um, is of Nuremberg, uh, post 2nd of January 1945. Once known as the Schetz cast line, basically uh, the gem of, of, of Germany, one of the most beautifully preserved medieval cities, was laid um, in ruin by the British RAF on the 2nd of January 1945. And that was also the scene um, that backdropped uh, the liberation of Nuremberg, um, officially held on the 20th of April 1945. So, as we uh, promised, uh, we're heading out of the um, exhibition, but not out of the building. And uh, if we take a look in front of us, we can see uh, the other tip of the spear that we talked about earlier, the spear through the spear. And it leads uh, right out um, into the centre of the building as a viewing platform. And what are we viewing? Um, what Hitler referred to as his cathedral, the cathedral of the movement, which of course, if we look at it now, is hard to believe. It was, as we said, never finished. But if we look at this picture here, um, a model from 1936, um, we can prepare, of course, uh, the reality with what was proposed. Um, instead of just the bare bones of a building, it would have all been clad in, in marble, uh, you wouldn't have seen any of the bare brickwork, of course. And unlike today, uh, with the building open to the sky, it was going to be covered by a glass roof with a capacity for around, um, uh, around 50,000 people. Uh, this building was actually only going to be used once a year. Well, 
that um, brings uh, me uh, to the end of our virtual tour of the museum. I hope you found it informative. I hope you've learned perhaps things you didn't know. Uh, that's it from me. Uh, goodbye. Thank you.